Thank you everyone for coming to the Boston Underground Film Festival 2022 Q&A for the animation block in between days. Thank you to our viewers and to our filmmakers who have joined us today to talk about their films. Now that we're all here, I would like to open it up to the filmmakers and see what their inspirations are. So I'd like to go around the room and hear a little bit more about your inspiration for the film that you made. So a lot of my work has to do with um, Appalachian folklore. Uh, I am an Appalachian artist um, and uh, been doing a lot of studying and research on different kinds of um, cryptoids and monsters that make up this community. Um, and more specifically, I had recently just lost my uncle um, to mental illness. And so it was time for me to kind of combine those two things, monster, real life monsters and um, animated monsters. Um, and so I wrote about a family monster called the Pottero. And this is a monster that has a very interesting anatomical situation happening where it cannot relieve itself. Um, this is a good way to start this talk off, right? Uh, <laughs> And um, yeah, kind of uh, making a metaphor for how we um, kind of carry around all of our stuff with us. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it's a 10 minute film that's talking about um, the community that I come from, the monsters that live here, uh, both in um, inside of us and outside of us in the woods. So, yeah. Argus is really just a film about work. I think it, all of us have had at least one job that we found extremely banal and extremely tedious. And in fact, I, uh, it mostly came from my experience as a job where I had a, a copywriter job. And I started noticing I could work less than two hours a day if I sat at my desk and then spend the rest of the six hours looking at cat videos or browsing the internet or figuring out different ways of tapping on the desk. And so just kind of, I just started seeing myself 10, 20, 30 years from now at the same job, enjoying my great salary, my great benefits, and just, just seeing my whole life like that, it, it uh, sort of existential dread came over me. So that was what gave birth to this film where a guy gets a job and the purpose of his job isn't really clear to him. He knows what he has to do, but he doesn't know why he has to do it. And so just seeing the way his coworker seems to be okay with that, but he is obsessed with the purpose of his job and therefore, you know, the purpose of his life and the way he ages without really knowing was just um, something that sort of speaks to me and, and speaks to, I think everyone wondering maybe what the purpose of their life is and if they're wasting it or not, all confined within a small space because we spend such a huge amount of time of our lives at work at least one third of our lives anyway um and and so sort of that existential dread was really what drove this project for me mine uh was a, a real pandemic film I, i'd been wanting to you know make a pandemic film i'd been wanting to make a film when the pandemic started so it was kind of like could be the worst or the best timing being stuck in my apartment. And I'm a stop motion animator. So I'm used to having to think about making a film that's in a confined space. That's, you know, I, I work out of my apartment in New York city. So like everything I make has to be really contained. And I had started making a film at the start of the pandemic that was not contained. It was actually a really big idea. And um, it was very like, um, about loneliness and it very was in the moment of what it felt like to be at the start of the pandemic and like, I made an animatic for it and everything and you know a couple months into working on that I was like this is not this is not it this will not work um so I kind of brainstormed and couldn't figure out what my pandemic film would be and um but I was stuck in my apartment all day and one thing that was kind of helping with the loneliness of that was I was watching a lot of animal cams um I love watching that I have like some tabs open now on my computer with eagle cams. So I was actually watching this exact same eagle cam that I have up now um, last year. And kind of this idea hit me that uh, an animal cam would be a really great setting for a film because it's a fixed camera, you have animals, it's kind of everything I like. And kind of the idea like just 
flew into my head and I talked to my creative partner and I said, I had this crazy idea. What if we did a film that was set in front of an animal cam and we started talking and literally within 10 minutes, we wrote a short horror film set in front of an animal cam. So it has a deer and this lady and, um, you know, it's a found footage film essentially, but stop motion. And it was great to make in my apartment because locked off camera, one tiny set, and um, I pulled it off in like four months and, uh, you know, finally found my pandemic film. I think to start off, I, the, the way that I've come to think of my film um, as I was making it and sort of the short, long and short of it is uh, focusing on atmospheric horror. And I like to think of the style as sort of somewhere in between Ghibli and Silent Hill is kind of how I've uh, explained it, which I think goes a long way to show what my inspirations are too. Um, it was sort of meant to explore atmospheric horror and sort of develop a world um, in a very short amount of time. It's only a minute and a half. And uh, it's sort of works as a trailer too for sort of a bigger project I wanna do, but I wanted to you know start small and see how much I could uh, develop a world um, in the shortest amount of time. So that was, that was my goal for the film. Uh, Johnny Crow is uh, it's created with uh, graffiti animation on large scale services. Jesse Coche is my co-director and he was the animator. And so he he created it on, you know, mural size pieces of wall all around the city and different parts of the province. The theme is um, about a young man who goes to jail and has to kind of deal with all of his stuff in order to get back out to be reunited with his child. And it's very poetic. There's a lot of um, poetic imagery in it. And we worked with Michalis Tucci, who's a spoken word uh, poet from the West Coast. And he wrote a poem to kind of go with it. It was originally inspired by a poem that I had written that's about kind of the, the warrior spirit and how it doesn't really have a place to exist in the world today that it's like, you know, gets kind of subverted and diverted into kind of violent places and yeah it took us like 10 years to make it Jesse like he took seven years to do all the animation because he can't really animate in winter we're up in Canada so he only could animate in the summer and it's like frame by frame by frame and then it got stuck on me for the soundtrack for a few years but <laughs> now it's uh finally out and we're really happy that uh, Buff has taken it on so thank you for screening it. Christine had this idea to make this film about this poem that she'd written um, a long time ago and she'd always wanted to make a film about it but never knew kind of exactly how it was all going to play out so since we'd started making films together uh, she just proposed the idea and of I you know we're, we we uh, we collaborate well and uh, it was a good opportunity for employment so um, but not only that, the film itself has a lot to do with uh, a lot of injustice and a lot of things that are important to me as a Indigenous person here in Canada. So, uh, yeah, there was a there was a lot of um, subject matter in the film that was uh, important for me to to talk about, and uh, but you know, um, ultimately it was kind of a project that she had. Uh, um, kind of had stirring in her, in her, in her kind of like, uh, projects. Um, so yeah, it just kind of, that's how it came to be. I mean, this film Fulcrum, I think it's a eight or nine minute, um, animation. And, and I, I think the, the inspiration is sort of hard to, to pin down. I just had a simple thought of, you know, I really like thinking about animation as like the study of motion and was interested, was trying to figure out what is an interesting motion to me. Um, because I'm not, I'm not really a storyteller in that way. And so the, the, the motion that I found interesting was rowing and I like, I enjoy rowing. And I think it's a very interesting rhythmical loop. And I wanted to make a film that was, that incorporated loops, but that took loops and then at some point the loop kind of breaks and then that moves into a new loop and then that loop breaks and then that and I wondered what would happen if it was kind of a film that was a series of loops that broke um, and that in some ways just kept kind of expanding out uh, in, a, in a kind of spiral type way so 
so that was kind of the the I guess I can say that now that was the inspiration. It took a long time to figure out. Um, I kind of like making films or I have in the past in, in almost a straight ahead fashion where I just know what the first couple shots are and I get started and then I figure out things as I go along and, and it's not always linear. Sometimes, you know, you figure out maybe three quarters of the way through and try to find a bridge to get there. Um, so I wouldn't say I knew that when I started <laughs> the film entirely. I just knew I had that as a, as a, as a formal concept for how it would work. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a combination, the animation style itself is a combination of hand-drawn and 3D and uh, stop motion. So I was interested in, it's kind of a three-part film and I was interested in each part having its own style that was um, hopefully apparent when people watch it, but somewhat, you know, visually tied together. Everybody Goes to the Hospital is a stop motion uh, short about my mother's emergency appendectomy in the early 1960s. Her uh, family didn't believe that uh, it was more serious than the flu, so she ended up coming down with gangrene of the intestines. And it's one of those stories that she told over and over and over again pretty much all the time. I was religiously homeschooled in rural Oregon as a child. And uh, so, you know, uh, I was with my mother all the time. So she would tell the story with her mother who lived next door, uh, almost beat for beat. So when I decided to put this in stop motion, I really wanted to capture sort of this fairy tale like telling that they would sort of mutually participate in. Um, so it always felt like a golden book or some sort of kid's story that uh, was incredibly traumatic, but they told it as if it were funny. Oh, we didn't believe her. The doctor said, you know, I don't like little girls who cry. And uh, so my mom would replay these moments like uh, all the time. And it was this big unprocessed trauma for her that she continued to relive. And, and I thought, you know, if I put it in stop motion and kind of show it as if she's recreating this story with dolls, uh, it would feel more appropriate to the way I experienced the telling. Um, and so I think I'd read Body Keeps the Score early on in the pandemic. And I thought that would be a really um, kind of fun exploration of of her story and journey um, while using puppets. In the Water's Wake is uh, about a boy that washes up on an island shore and he discovers this festive town and then gets swept up into this mysterious parade, but not everything is as it seems as things take a darker turn. Um, I believe the film idea originated from a dream I had and I wrote it down in like a dream journal and I did some sketches on it. And then a year later, when I was thinking of different ideas for a fi film, I was going through those old sketchbooks and I saw my old ideas and I was like, oh, wait a minute, that could actually kind of be cool. Um, so I had just explored that idea, but I'm definitely inspired by um, like fairy tales and mythology, the circus. And you can definitely see that throughout the film in the style that I chose for it, which is very much like children's illustrated um, storybook type. Um, yeah, and it's definitely a film that I I wanted it to be about stuff that I personally liked. I made it during um, the pandemic, so I it was originally my um, senior thesis for college, and so I made it all at home in my family home. So it was something that I definitely wanted to enjoy making. So it's filled with a lot of different things that I love and enjoy. My movie is uh, Pancake Panic. And uh, the inspiration for this was um, vengeance, kind of. I wanted to get back at my friend. So I had this friend and he was uh, telling me one day that he wants to be a film director, but there's no point in doing it because it's too hard and you need a big budget and you have to have spaceships and aliens and explosions to do it. Otherwise, there's no point in being a filmmaker. And I found this really offensive. 
So I said, no, you just need a really good story. I said, if you're a good filmmaker or a good writer, you should be able to make a story about, uh, and off the top of my head, I said a pencil. You should be able to tell a story about a pencil. And he said, uh, no way, that's bullshit. So this was years ago. And as I was uh, thinking of what I should make an animated film about, I thought now's my chance to get back at this guy and, and, and really you know, give him the business. So one of the stories in the movie is about a pencil. And uh, it's nine stories total. It's a, a story circle. The, the end scene is the same as the first. And when you get to the end, the, the whole thing makes sense. So um, yeah, I'm quite pleased that I, I, I uh, was able to strike him down with all my fury and create a story about a pencil. <laughs> Sarah, uh, she said um, she made her movie based on a dream. My other eight stories in my movie also based on a dream, so. Uh, Ramit Hakori, um, <clears throat> it's a 2D anim hand-drawn animation um, in, uh, in live action uh, sets and like the backgrounds are live action video um, of little dioramas that we made um, and also some live action outdoor footage. Um, and what was the inspiration for Hakori? Uh, we are living East Coast of, oh, near Boston, very close to Boston. And it, it's, it's based on the trees and the atmosphere, foggy morning or, right? Like beautiful leaves, like inspiration, for, to, especially to me from Japan, like a in, inspiration by this environment. Also like some kind of ceremony at that moment, the years and years ago when we started making Hakkori, it was 2000, when? 2012. 2012. We are really into uh, like a fermentation system. So we we wanted to mix with fermentation. What's the behind of fermentation as a as a metaphor, maybe like a tarot card, but put in a, happening in here. It's not exactly here, but using atmosphere of New England. Yeah, and it, it, the story is of these two characters who are making a harvest offering, um, going up a mountain make, to make a harvest offering, and things go awry, and how they how they deal with that. Um, and you know, uh, I guess we shot part of it live action, but um, definitely the characters and sort of what happens um, could could not have been made you know with live action. There would have had to be some animation involved, so it was a natural result the using animation was the only way it could happen i think yes um oh what rice oh what beans is about just that it's about a man who is obsessed with rice and beans it's the only thing he eats it's the only thing he does um this was inspired <laughs> by my own obsession with rice and beans which began um, for unknown reasons, um, I just became very obsessed with rice and beans. I think it may have been because at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when there was a bit of like food scarcity issues, uh, people were making rice and beans, um, just giant pots of rice and beans. So it was like, in living in some sort of world uh, made of rice and beans. Um, and so I guess that's what inspired it. I, but honestly, it was just I woke up one day and realized, man, I have been thinking and talking about rice and beans for the past like several weeks. Um, so it's, um, it's animated because. Um, uh you know animation's just free you can do whatever you want um you can oh it's also 2d um it was made in procreate um and you know i just felt like i could go completely off the rails with this idea 
um, and go into some strange places uh, because of its animated nature. So um, yeah, thanks so much for screening it. It really means a lot. The Bum Family is a collective of six cousins and my mom and my cousin's mom, so my aunt. And I'm the eldest and the youngest is eight years younger than me and everyone else is in between. And our grandma is a dog show person. So the year prior to Lily Goes to the Dogs, we made Lily Goes Fishing because our grandpa really likes fishing and we have like a cabin that we go fishing to every summer. And so we were like, we have to make one for grandma. And me and the other eldest cousin, Berlin, we would go out to Victoria to help with the dog show in the summer. And let me tell you, if you've never been to a dog show, it is a wild time. Um, if you've ever seen Best in Show, it is exactly like that. Like the characters and the dogs are just so extra. And we wanted to try to capture that in a film setting. And Lily is um, a like giant 10 foot tall orange fuzzy cyclops monster who exists in the human world and kind of gets up to all sorts of things. So we made the film for our grandma and all of her like friends at the dog show and all of the ridiculous things that happen. And we choose to animate because since there is such a large age gap, there's jobs for everyone to do and everyone contributes to the art and everyone contributes to the story. And it's like a really collaborative process. Um, and Lily Monster can do anything that you can't do in real life. So she turns into the shape of a poodle and she can go through a like car wash machine and be fine and all of these ridiculous things that um, you can do when you're making characters out of paper instead of actual, you know, real things. Yeah, but we love Boston Underground. Um, so much and we're so grateful to be in your programming again. <laughs> this film I, I describe as a song written for Nightcrawler's Compost and Shadows and it is kind of a metaphor. Um, it's drawing on a comparison between um, the alchemical processes involved in uh, film development and the photosynthetic processes of plant in the sense that they both work with light in different ways. Um, and it came about because I did a residency at a place called the Film Farm in rural Ontario, in Mount Forest, Ontario. Um, and there we learned how to uh, make homemade developer out of foraged plants and vitamin C and washing soda. And it turns out you can actually process film in that. Um, and so something about hand processing films using, you know, very simple um, materials and means and, and, you know, processing it in buckets was very magical to me. So um, I, I thought thematically I would work with the idea of magic and it also, because the developer was made out of plants that, you know, I just ripped out of the ground to make um, sort of a tea um, to develop it in. Um, I thought also um, I would work with the plant and botanical imagery uh, for the film itself. Um, so uh, I ended up collecting tiny plants and laying them directly on the film stock and exposing them with a flashlight to make a photogram. And, uh, and it was summer, so I also killed a bunch of mosquitoes that were biting me and laid those on the film stock as well. So it really is a kind of inspired by like the season. Um, I started the film in summer at the film farm and then had to pause for a long time and then pick it up again in spring just as plants were reemerging. It was getting warm again. So it really is about, you know, that kind of lush environment. And in Canada, I'm in Canada where we have long, harsh, dead winters. So yeah, so it's kind of about that kind of emotional attachment to the plants too. Yeah. And then animation because um, uh, I, I really, especially, you know, there's so many different types of animation and, and techniques that you can use. And I think for this particular film, um, I was really interested in both the aspect of autonomy. So doing this, you know, really just using mostly just my body to make the film um, and the kind of tactility of that process. 
Um, so yeah, just something about being able to touch everything and make everything by hand, including all the images um, and then hand process the film as well. So it was really, it was really about the kind of directness that animation offered in this way. The next thing I want to talk about, this is the specifically animation block of the festival, although we do have animations playing at other blocks. In addition to the themes that you have all described as being very different and the subject matter being very different, your styles are all very different. And I would like to hear more about what brought you to animation rather than another style of filmmaking and what your specific process is like. I came to animation maybe a little bit untraditionally. I, I did go to film school and I, I um, studied 16 millimeter in particular, and then I uh, realized I do not like other human beings. So <laughs> slow, <laughs> slowly started seeing how I can create my own work, have full creative control and not, not rely. It's probably not a healthy thing to do, but not rely on other people to make it happen. So a lot of my earlier work is um, 60 mil live action, um, but thematically I realized that most of those films act, had um, a bit of animation within them because uh, I'm dealing with um, uh, young people, mostly young women who are kind of going through trauma. And so um, I'm super influenced by Marjane Sadrapi who did Persepolis, um, uh, Phoebe Gleckner who wrote A Diary of a Teenage Girl and they all are doing these like graphic novel style, Linda Berry, um, all these like kind of graphic novel styles. And uh, that was what I had been, always been playing with. So um, yeah, animation, I think allows you to hit some of those kind of darker themes without it being um, so off-putting. Uh, my Pottero starts with a suicide. I think if it was a live action film starting with a suicide, it wouldn't be as funny <laughs> as it actually or is supposed to be. So I think about that a lot when I'm when I'm trying to 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 work with some of these darker themes or these um, ideas and how um, an audience might be more willing to experience that through an animation just because of what we're what we're used to. Um, so trying to subvert the uh, the form in some way, like I think all of us are. For Argus, I, I mostly did animation for two major reasons. The first was practical, because there's some scenes of a lot of spectacle, and then the person has to age um, from sort of young. I actually have him right here. He doesn't have hands. Uh oh, here, put the blur there. He doesn't have hands right now, so sorry, but there's the guy. But anyway, he has to he has to age um, a full lifetime, so it. it that that would have turned into bad make bad live action makeup um also it was a pandemic film as well so it was it just made things a lot easier just to stay home and like, not be around people as well i made the whole thing in four months also actually so it was like four months of sort of uh, one month of getting everything together two months to film and then a month at the end for post and sound and music and everything and then the other reason was just artistically, um, stop motion, I always find has something very unsettling about it. So it always does well. You'll see a lot of horror in this in the stop motion genre or stop motion in the horror genre because there's just something inherently unsettling about it. Um, just like seeing, you know, it's an object, but it's moving like a real thing. So I just think that is such a cool effect that it always has. So uh, that's my reason. I fully agree with everything about stop motion. And um, I came to it kind of, I guess, the traditional way that I, I grew up loving animation and, um, you know, all the normal, you know, typical animation everyone loves, you know, Hollywood films and Disney and everything. But I always really loved sculpting and making stuff and working with my hands. I always preferred that over drawing. So um, I kind of like latched onto stop motion pretty early even though at the time there was like very little stop motion being made, but I kind of didn't care about that and said, I want to somehow do that. So I went to art school and studied it. So it's always been my preferred way to, to work. Um, I just love making puppets. Like that's been my absolute favorite thing is making the puppets and bringing everything to life. And yeah, I mean, there's just nothing better than having your characters tangible and you can hold them, but they're not humans because I don't like humans either. I'd rather work with puppets. I think there's a lot of themes with animators. We do like working in rooms by ourselves. So it's been, um, you know, it's been my preferred medium to tell stories. And I have really gravitated toward horror 
horror in the last few years. I worked on kid stuff for a long time and maybe it was just kind of a, a reaction to like course correct and go as far away from kid stuff as possible. So I've really been enjoying that. And there is that inherent creepiness. So I'm really kind of diving deep into horror with all of the projects I'm on work on now. So just uh, more horror, more, more puppets. That's all I want to do. I think animation was always, uh, it was just a logical place for me to end up as someone who liked drawing their whole life and was also interested in film. So I was sort of brought into that. But <clears throat> as I got deeper into animation, I sort of realized um, all of the, the pros against, you know, traditional film where budgets can be much smaller, you can, you know, have a much smaller crew, uh, which is really nice if you want to make something, but you don't have a budget, you can just make it yourself if you have enough time to eventually, you know, get it done. Um, so that was very uh, exciting for me, I guess, as a, as a young filmmaker with, you know, no means to, to really do a big project uh, traditionally, um, really in any capacity. But if I had this big idea to do with animation, um, I could get it done if I, you know, just worked hard enough because money wasn't really as involved. As far as horror, um, I feel like I, I recently got more into horror. I, that wasn't always my goal, I guess, but I've always had like an interest, I guess, in horror and animation, a animated horror in general, I think is something you don't see that much, uh, at least like in the mainstream. But I always thought that it was a very, it's a very good place um, for uh for animation to be is in the horror genre because there's so many possibilities there's so much more you can do i think uh stylistically and like i don't know just as a whole there's so many more concepts you can explore when you don't have the the limitation of live action um but of course it could be more work to come up with all that stuff but yeah, I just think in general animation can be so much more versatile. And that's why I think I probably will just stick with animation for the rest of my filmmaking career because it's it's just so much more versatile. Yeah, I've done live action and animated films. I come from a theater background, physical theater. So like masks, puppetry, stilt walking, that kind of um, realm. And they're, they're definitely related uh, animation in that realm of performance is definitely related just kind of like the understanding of movement and the exaggeration of things. Of course, animation is cool because you're, you're not, you're only limited by your imagination. You want to have a helicopter fly in, you want to do anything elaborate, you can just, just takes really long. It doesn't, <laughs> but it doesn't take a massive budget. So, um, I am not an animator, though. I'm more of a writer and a director. I do with the Bum family occasionally. Like we we create those films over a period of time, and then we shoot the whole thing on uh, uh, the May long weekend. The Quick Draw Animation Society here has a animation lockdown, and people make a film in that 48 hours or whatever it is. And so occasionally, there's a couple scenes that the kids are just like, I don't want to do that. And so my sister and I will step in and animate those and I'm definitely not as good as my kids at animating that stuff. So it's, um, it is just such a magical medium. Like it really is, the audience just kind of will go with you even with really simple things and really simple treatment of animation right up to, you know, full scale Pixar, every little hair is moving. It's just, it's fantastic. Like hearing about Emily's film and that hand process style and stuff like there's just such a huge range of possibilities with the work. So with Johnny Crow, Jesse and I did a spray paint animation film before about a woman that had been murdered behind right where I'm sitting. Um, and so we wanted to commemorate her instead of just doing a mural, we did an animated uh, story about a bird. Like we didn't wanna talk about the murder directly. And then we immediately started working on Johnny Crow right after that and he shot it like all over the place in different locations and different places because it was it's just difficult that scale of animation it was really challenging but uh but you know it's incredible it's an incredible piece of art that he's made and i don't know i don't think we'll be doing another one like that anytime soon though but anyway that's enough about me thanks for the opportunity to chat
Most of the film was made uh, just on a surface, like either an uh, outside wall or uh, like a temporary wall that I constructed and or just like a piece of wood basically sometimes and then I would animate most most times with spray paint and I would just paint my subject and take a picture and then move it a bit take a picture and then replace the background as if it was like a seamless animation and uh yeah a lot of really you know um a lot of long days with not much progression because you're animating so much at once and you would change your picture a little bit and that would take a long time and then you'd only get a few few frames a day sometimes but uh uh i i, I really enjoy that because i'm kind of out there with a camera on the street and uh just able to paint look at my previous frame see where i want to go and see where i've got came from and you know i really enjoy the whole process so uh, it's re very repetitive and you don't really get much progress, but it's, it's really rewarding and, uh, still pretty uh, unique and it's, um, so I, I, I really like how it looks and on the side of a building and places like that. I, I feel like I, I only think in animation I've done live action, but I haven't done it in 10 or 15 years. Um, and I, I don't know, I always, like I teach animation and I always tell my students, I don't think, you know, you'll hear Pixar or some studio say, oh, it takes five years and to make a film or something. And I always think it takes that long to make a narrative too. They just, you know, you, when you include the writing and the fundraising. And so I don't think animation takes any longer. I think it offers a sense of freedom for me to just get up in the morning and come to this desk and, and work on a film without a crew. And, um, and I'm really, formally interested in things so i think that animation it's not all form but it always is a form it always is a formal endeavor and that's important to me um and i think i mentioned my film has a few different styles of animation because i think that each each type of animation each style has a has a sort of like that form has a key to its own uh you know sort of consciousness and i think that animation is kind of always about a different level of consciousness or a, or or has that opportunity to explore things more than live action does because one object can morph into another object in a few frames or, um, or whatnot, right? So um, yeah, so I think that's why animation for me, um, I think I already talked a little bit about the process for me kind of involving multiple forms and whatnot. So um, yeah, I think that's all I'm gonna say. Well, creating my film, there was definitely uh, a handful of challenges, but those challenges did end up influencing uh, the look of my film, which I think was overall for the better. Um, so one of the major things uh, going back home away from school and the nice expensive equipment and all the tools was I was down on processing power. So I had to work with what I had. Um, and by doing that, I wanted my film to have like a certain polished and textured look to it. So. I had like limited amount of processing, but I still wanted it to look very nice. So that influenced me working in this um, way of creating my assets in Photoshop and then compiling them in After Effects to create um, this motion graphics storybook look. Um, and then I do add other <laughs> animation methods into it because there is a part of it that has regular 2D animation as well as a little bit of experimental. Um, and you know it the style that i went with does influence like it works with the story that is being told in my film but working in that way definitely has its challenges since it's kind of like i don't know you're working it feels like i'm working in the dark a bit so i have to do a lot of pre-planning and just like thinking ahead while creating all my assets um to try and like solve all my problems that i'll face when comp compiling and then compositing um ahead before i run into those problems um so that was different, one of the challenges of creating the film. Um, and why I went with animation, I think has been said a little bit by some people already, but it's definitely, you can create fantastical in imagery uh, with a low budget. You know, you don't need expensive cameras or special effects to create um, this beautiful and just like beautiful imagery. And that you get a lot of freedom with creativity by having just 
I don't know, no bounds by that, no bounds that like the physical <laughs> world has uh, with that. I've always been obsessed with uh, animation and uh, my background is in live action and documentaries, but I kind of found that stuff exhausting. And I love the idea of animation. You have complete control over the frame. It's not, um, oh, the actor missed their line and we have to take, do another 10 takes or we're losing the light or we have to get this one location and we film something, we can't go back there because otherwise they're gonna charge us a bunch of money and oh, the costume doesn't look right. And you know, you do the best you can to, to you know, get it just right. And then you look at it in editing and it's still dreadful. So it's just heartbreaking. So I love the fact that you have complete control over everything that goes in there and you can take as long as you want and you don't need anybody else's help. <laughs> so, I mean, my movie, I, I did it all in Photoshop and then, you know, in uh, After Effects, I created uh, 2D puppets and I could just, you know, do it all myself and all I need is a laptop and some, you know, really good cookies and, and a bagel or whatever and, you, you know, you're all set and you can just grind away until it's exactly as you want or, as, you know, until you've had enough of it. So, yeah, I, I see it as all upside. Animation is all upside. So it kind of, um, it was a huge revelation when I was like, oh, just animate it, you idiot. And, and you don't have to go through all of this, this trauma of trying to film things and make it perfect. So it's, um, you know, it was a big turning point. There's sort of no going back now. Once you see what, what you have available to you and, and the endless palette and the endless scope, there's really, you know, there's no, no other choice really, so. Yeah, so uh, with Hakori, well, we, we've been making animation for a long time, um, 2D animation for a long time. And actually the challenges with this particular project was that we were incorporating, we were doing a bunch of stuff that we hadn't tried before, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> namely compositing the 2D animation with sort of video footage. So the biggest challenge was the live action part <laughs> in this, um, because normally I think we would normally we would animate, do all the animation, hand-drawn animation stuff first, and then be like, okay, what's the background going to look like? <clears throat> or how does that, how does the background kind of fit into this? But with this one, we had to plan everything out with the background in mind first and sort of animate in the, in the background, basically, <clears throat> after, after the fact. So that was sort of the biggest challenge. Norm normally with animation, we're just as everyone else has been saying, you know, you, you just go in and you start doing it and it's very, you know, you don't need any other other people to really come in on a, a crew or anything or expensive equipment. You know, we've always done things fairly cheaply. Um, and, uh, and you know, the, for this animation, for the footage that we took, it was mostly on a, a iPhone and friends DSLR that they lent us. So um, even there, it was kind of like stuff that we already had it that are um, access to, so. Um, and our process normally, um, what's our process like normally? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, what's the normal process? Normally it's a lot, it's mostly, you know, a long time of, of discussing things and planning things and brainstorming. And then the actual animation is, um, you know, just go in and, you know, we have a list of things that we need to do and we draw it in. Um, either Photoshop, we used to draw in Photoshop, sometimes in Procreate, sometimes in, we've been using a lot of Clip Studio um, recently um, that has a good sort of workflow that we can do with the um, sort of static uh, watercolor mats that we, we, mm. we use um, in our animation. Uh, and then we'll composite it in After Effects and either pull the clips into Premiere or, or something, something to that, like some video editing software afterwards, so. So I made, uh, oh, what rice, oh, what beans and Procreate and After Effects. Um, and um, I just found that process just perfect, just completely perfect for this. Um, finding out about Procreate was a game changer for me because I, previously was just doing like ink on paper drawings 
which just took a long time um, because, you know, you also have to like color in everything, but procreate, you can just do it right on the iPad. Um, I love procreate so much. Um, and you know, animation is just the coolest thing ever because, um, you can, I mean, yeah, like everybody else has said, you can do whatever you want. I've always like envied novelists because they can just like, you know, go up to their desk and, you know, just write, shut the door, um, and, you know, just stay in that zone. Uh, when I've tried to do live action in the past, um, it's not as fulfilling um, because, you know, it kind of heightens my anxiety brain uh, because you have to like coordinate schedules. You have to go up to people and be like, hey, can I film in your bar, please? No? Okay, that's okay. I'll go somewhere else. But with animation, you can just draw the bar and that is perfect. Um, the challenges, really, I didn't really have any. Um, nothing that uh, nothing that monumental, just the normal trying to get it to the right length, um, trying to get this scene to make sense, trying to get this shot to make sense. Um, there was just like one scene that worked well on the page that kind of did not actually work in the, in the actual cut. Um, but I mean, that, that was it. I, I just love animation because, um, because of all that, I feel like I'm an animator at heart. Um, and I also love doing like weird voices and stuff. <laughs> and animation is perfect for that. It was built for that. So yeah, all hail animation. It is the best. Since it is a collective of eight people, <clears throat> sorry, um, since it's a collective of eight people, all animating and there is such a vast age difference our process does take a really long time we make um on average like one film a year and it starts um in like september because also at the time that we made this film i was in grade 12 and everyone else was also in like school in elementary junior high and high school um yeah, so we start in September and first we come up with the kind of concept of what we want our film to be and just general plot items that we want to happen or moments that we want to happen. When we were doing Lily Goes to the Dog specifically, it was a lot of it was based on me and Berlin's experiences at the dog show and trying to translate that to the rest of the group as well as like what the character design and all of that looks like, which was a little bit more. Um, it was a little more difficult than our usual films because our usual films is what should this character look like? Oh, whatever you want. And then you just kind of go from there. Um, but once we come up with the script, then my mom, Christine, uh, comes up with uh, like, she writes the rest of the script so that it actually makes sense. And then we come up with a production list and like a scene list and we split up who wants to do what. So there are some scenes that people really want to do. And then, like she said, there are always scenes that everyone's like, oh, this would be so funny. And then it's like, okay, who wants to animate it? And we're like, mm -hmm. not me. <laughs> um, just because we're not really sure of the logistics of it because all of our animation is cut out paper and watercolor. So we hand draw everything and cut it all out. And that's where my aunt comes in. She's amazing. She like cuts everything out for us and outlines it all in black Sharpie and just kind of sits in the corner with her exacto knife and like does all of the little tiny details that um, when we were little, we didn't have the dexterity to do. And now it's just kind of her role. And um, yeah, and then we work every weekend for about three hours. And then when it comes to the May long weekend at Quick Draw Animation Society in Calgary, they are amazing. They're like totally a family. Um, we go and we animate for 48 hours straight in, well, 48 hours straight as much as like children between the ages of like 17 and nine can do. Um, 
and we pair up. So me and Berlin pair up and then my middle sister and Berlin's middle sister pair up and then our youngest sisters pair up and we animate our scenes together. And then we, there's lots of snacks involved. There's also like a little pop-up tent that's the meltdown corner. So that when people are having a moment, they can just like go, we like go for walks together and we have lunch outside and like, our moms really take care of us in that they're like, okay, you still have to do all of the things that like humans have to do. Um, and then I generally do the first pass of an edit because I personally don't love animating. I really enjoy like the technical side of it. And so I generally do the first animation and then we have our editor, Neil, who does the next pass. And then we also voice all of the characters ourselves and we decide who does what and it's, like we're really a team from start to finish. Um, and actually in 2023, it'll be our 10 year anniversary of animating together, which is insane. Um, and yeah, we did do live action. It was our first film together was called Super Canola. And we're from Alberta where a large export is canola oil. And um, our first film ever was in, I think, I think Super Canola was 2011. And it is about scientists genetically engineering the canola plant. So my sister Medina plays the canola plant and we put different pants on her to be like different genes. And um, we talk about like how big canola companies will genetically engineer canola to, and then let the wind spread it and then go and sue the small farmers that get screwed over. Um, and my eldest cousin, who is not part of the Bum family, is like trying to go into business. And he's like, I think we should like get rid of that film because what if I want to work for a canola company? And what if that hurts my chances? And we're like, if you work for a canola company, you're going to have bigger problems. <laughs> like, um, yeah, so it's really a team effort and like people draw what they want to draw and they voice who they want to voice and um it's just it was a really good opportunity to get to spend a lot of time with my cousins like I'm really close with all of them and yeah it can be exhausting sometimes it's animation is and everyone's saying oh well you can do it without your crew we couldn't have made any of these films without our team like it's yeah we're a unit so and then we also did a live action film this uh, past year, like 2020, we started it right at the beginning of the pandemic um, and it's called Pollution Solution. And it's about how people feel about pollution and what we think you can do to like solve pollution issues. And we like interviewed um, people and then we animated on top of it, like digitally. So it was a little bit more stressful. It wasn't our usual, um the usual way that we go so things were a little bit more complicated but yeah well it's so touching to hear about the bum family and how you all work I'm just like really enthralled by this um this peak at this process is very unique and kind of beautiful um so yeah I I've done I mean we're all talking about our relationship to live action I do shoot live action I do a lot of music videos so um you know sometimes you have to do live action because you have to be really quick and um I also do video art with collaborators that is live action but it's a little more free form it's a little less uptight more improvisational um, so it's not so bad, um, but I do, I am relating to everything everybody's been saying about animation being really liberating in a lot of ways. And um, I, I find it, I used to not have the patience to do it because um, I thought, gosh, what a labor intensive way to make just a few seconds of media at a time. But now I actually find it meditative and relaxing and I consider it a sanctuary to go in and just to be able to draw frame by frame for hours on end. Pedal to the Metal doesn't have any frame by frame drawing but that's what I usually do um, with animation but I've done a lot of different techniques and so um, I think the I think drawing is actually my favorite um, like I draw by hand on, like on paper on a light table and I listen to music while I do it and to me that it's there's just like no better day than 
like putting on my favorite playlists and just like drawing all day. <laughs> it's like heaven to me. So, so this film is actually my very first film that I've ever made. Um, and uh, I had been predominantly writing and producing other content, a lot of documentary work. And for a few years, I had sort of gotten involved working for a futurist who was trying to pair really high-end VFX artists and architects and engineers to try to come up with solutions about changing the world. And so in the process of doing that, I learned how to communicate between two very different minds. I was like translating English to English but uh, visual artists to technical uh, brains. And I got sort of inspired by them. Um, at one point I got to uh, work with a, a Disney Imagineer and he had worked kind of building the background for the new Star Wars land, just creating the whole visual effect and world that every architect and engineer would be pulling from to build the new theme parks and hotels and things. And in that process, uh, I was like, I think I, I think I now know how to maybe approach some different uh, amazing artists and talk to them and, and see if I can translate some of these ideas into actual physical form. And so I'd been thinking about it for a long time. I had asked a couple of friends who were like, don't do stop motion, it'll ruin your life. It'll take too long. It's the most expensive, soul-sucking process. And I was like, it can't be that hard. People do it and it's wonderful. Well, uh, you know, they weren't totally wrong. Uh, it was extremely difficult, uh, but we put together a, a lovely team. Um, my uh, main animator, uh, Eric Oxford, um, is also a fantastic fabricator. And so during the pandemic, um, we met through a friend who became the producer of the project, Charles Piper. And he was the only person who said, this is absolutely a stop motion. We can absolutely do this. And it's the pandemic. So this is the best time in the world, let's go. And I think within two weeks of him reading the script, we'd be like, this is, this is what it is. Um, we met Eric and we're like, I think, I think we can do this. And uh, I think uh, we, we later were like, should we have been so gung ho? But, uh, but, but I'm glad, I'm really glad we were. Um, we uh, kept kind of convincing each other and other people to get involved. And I spent so much time in VFX that the idea of stop motion in this tactile form uh, had kind of become an obsession. So then all of a sudden we were like, well, what else can we build? What else can we build? And so we kept pulling in more and more people who could help. And then, you know, there's that moment where you're like, is it necessary to be building a car and crafting all of these 3D models? I don't know how to do this, but now we're doing it. Now we're halfway through it. Now we're flocking things. Now we're spray painting it. It's a mess. Everything's everywhere. Oh my gosh, is it ever going to end? And it just, it kept, we kept upping it. And that was really, really fun and stressful and scary and exhilarating. And I, we're doing it again already. We kind of ended up creating a little collective in the middle of the pandemic. We're like, we think we're gonna just maybe pass scripts around and keep going. Um, so uh, the illustrator from the project, uh, a wonderful librarian from the North of England that uh, did all of our posters and artwork for chapter scenes, Chris Alsop, he was like, I have an amazing script. So we just kind of were like, yes, let's keep going. Let's keep making, let's keep animating and bringing together uh, more stories that sort of focus on emotional truth um, from a, a specific artist's point of view. So that was sort of where we came to it. Like, this is what we wanna do and in LA, there are so many amazing people here that are like, let's, let's just do this. Let's make things. We don't get to make as many art films. We get sucked into shows and things that are fun, but we barely get to actually collaborate. So it was a perfect opportunity. 
Well, I want to thank everyone for not only joining me today on this Q&A, but for submitting your films so that I could watch them and that we could show them to everyone at Buff. Uh, it's going to be an amazing program, and I'm so glad you are all part of it. Thank you again.